Hi everyone and welcome to a brand new video series called C Sharp CLR Internals and today we're going to be talking about switch case. This is going to be a multi-part video because the switch case has a lot of features as an instruction. So it's a very big topic to, to talk about and that's why it's going to be split into multiple videos. But today we're just going to focus on simple switch case examples with uh, mostly numbers. So let's jump in. And if we have a code like that, and uh, for example, we're trying to check for something, um, if X is, for example, equal to two, then we're gonna return two. And if X is equal to one, then we're gonna return one. What you're gonna see that the compiler will generate a bunch of um, comparing instructions. So first of all, we're gonna compare if X is equal to two, and if it's not equal, we're gonna jump to one. And if this isn't equal, then we're gonna return zero. Otherwise, we're just gonna return two or one. So this is a very simple if else statement. And by comparison, let's uh, see how we can rewrite this in a switch case uh, manner, right? But first of all, let's ask ourselves a question. Why would we want to rewrite this in a switch case scenario, for example? Well, most of the time, the community and Microsoft will recommend that you use a switch case keyword when you have a bunch of if else if statements, because what they claim is that the performance of a switch case will be faster. And second of all, you have much more readability and much more control because the switch case, it's much, uh, it's like a simpler instructions instruction. You can read it um, without any problems. It's not so deep. It's not so nested. And you have a bunch of additional features under your tool belt. So we're going to put the performance claim to the test today. So let's try and rewrite this in a switch case manner. So let's do switch X um, case to return two. And let's do now case one return one. So almost the same code got generated, but as you can probably tell, it's a bit different. So now we're comparing our X to one. And if it's equal, uh, then we're going to return. And otherwise we're going to compare it to two. And if it's equal, then we're going to return two. Otherwise we're going to return zero. So as you can see, these branches got sorted which is undesirable for high performance scenarios. Well, because what's happening in high performance scenarios. So um, there's, a, there's this component called branch predictor and it will do speculative branch analysis and it will take branches speculatively. So in order to increase performance, by the way, but in order to like work with it and um, you know make it fast, what you have to do is you have to order your branches in a very specific way in high performance scenarios. So that sorting operation here will completely destroy that process. So for example, Intel recommends that the most likely branches should be at the top and uh, the less likely branches should be uh, at the bottom of this sort of if else if chain, right? So that's one of the examples that you can sort of have, but there's more optimization techniques around like setting up branches in a very specific way, but this will completely trash it. So it's not very good for like high performance, but still, this is a very simple example. It's just two branches. So maybe if we keep adding branches, more interesting things are going to happen. And let's see. So let's do case zero now and let's return zero. So as you can tell, probably this is completely different now. So this code um, got changed effectively to a jump table. So the correct uh, terminology is the offset jump table. And this is the part where we have our jump table. So we're going to load a table from this address here. Then we're going to pick the correct index of the table. And then we're going to load our address, uh, the first address of this method. And um, having all of this, so let's add the offset to our base and this will actually create a jump to the correct instruction here. So that table contains relative addresses of this method here. So now what we have is we have a jump table, which is interesting and it's really cool. And you might ask yourself, 
why is this even here? Well, the obvious answer is because of the performance, because the jump table should be faster than a bunch of like if else statements that uh, this sort of generated in the previous example. So let's put that to the test now. So let's go to some code and let's measure the performance of our if else statement. So we just have two statements as before and let's measure the performance and let's do a bunch of measurements and then let's average them out. So let's see here. So it took 80 ish milliseconds, right? By comparison, let's see how our simple switch case um, will get handled with sorts branches. So our simple switch case runs in about 90 milliseconds. So um, the performance is a bit worse uh, as compared to if else statement, but like Microsoft and people recommend, if you have a lot of them, then you should consider using a switch case because otherwise there's no benefits. So let's test out the free case scenario. So we have now free cases here and let's do an if else check. So unsurprisingly, that didn't take uh, much longer because, well, first of all, this data set is not uniform, it's increasing. So the branch predictor will have an easy um, job to optimize this and take the correct branches always. But um, let's uh, see how our switch case performs, which now will generate a jump table. So let's see how it performs. And perhaps surprisingly, it's two times worse than the last switch case and the last if else statement. So um, why is that? Well, if we look at the jump table code, then what you're gonna see is that these instructions will have a cost associated with them. And that cost is a const cost, but it's not free. So we're paying for that. So perhaps if this is a const cost, Maybe if we have a really big, you know, if else chain that uh, would be faster. So let's check it out. So now what I have here is I have a big else, uh, else if chain and um, let's see now how will this perform. So now that takes 280 milliseconds. So let's now check the same switch case example you know that we're gonna have the same checks but we're gonna be using a switch case which means that we're gonna be using the jump table now and like i said the cost should be pretty much the same as it is so it takes roughly 126 milliseconds as the first example of the jump table so that means Indeed, the switch case is probably faster in most scenarios as opposed to a chain of if else statements, because as you can see, the jump table has a static cost associated with it. There's other ways that this is really interesting because that table is very robust and that, um, that whole feature is very robust and we're gonna see now uh, what else it can do to improve performance. So let's jump to um, CLR code and Let's um, let's actually see how this is implemented. So this is called a lowering, this this feature here. So a lowering in a compiler it means you know we're gonna take a complicated abstraction, for example, a complicated um, set of instructions, and then we're gonna rewrite them in order to be more simple in a way. So this is what it is. Um, maybe it's not more simple in this case, but um, it's much more optimal at least. So as you can see, this is a gigantic feature. This is one method, by the way. And this contains like something like 800 to 1000 lines of code, if, if we would do the counts correctly. So it's a very big feature with a lot of branches, a lot of things that can optimize the switch case in different ways. So let's see how else we can optimize this. So for example, if we have just two jump targets and then by jump target, I mean, if our method has, um, because this return, by the way, is going to be a part of this switch, even if it's not uh, written out as default, it will be implied that this is the default path in the switch case because we don't have any code here. So 
let's see what's going to happen if we just have two jump targets. So this is a jump target and this is a jump target. So we still sort of generated right now our you know jump table, but let's see what's going to happen if we keep adding cases. So let's add another case and let's just call this case like four, for example. And now what we have is we generate a bit test. So that bit test will be much faster than a jump table. And why we can actually generate a bit test? Well, because what we have here is just a bunch of instructions and uh, that bit test is totally doable here. So this is faster. And we can go even faster if we don't have any gaps in our cases because the bit test got generated only because the, our numbers aren't really without any gaps. So if we don't have any gaps, now we can reduce it to a simple, just, just a simple check because what we're gonna do now is we're gonna check if we're within this range and that's, that's going to be it because remember, we have just one jump target. But if we have some simple gaps, then we can do a bit test to do the same thing. So that's two interesting cases where this um, table got optimized away, but it got optimized in a very specific and interesting ways. So let's fix our jump targets and let's do the following. So as you can see now, this code generates a jump table again, but we have this compare with four. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna check if we're in this range. If we're not, then we're gonna jump to zero. And remember that this array that got generated, the table is indexed by, by our X here. So what's gonna happen if we're gonna have a big gap? Let's, let's for example say that our gap is going to be five. That's still good, but what about nine? Well, if we have nine, then we check if we're within this range and we're gonna generate a jump table for this range exclusively. And if we're not in this range, we're gonna jump to 1D and we're just gonna emit um, what we can call an if statement. So now this is a jump table plus an if statement. Okay, so what's going to, what's going to happen if we add more? So let's add like 10 and let's correct it to nine and 10, for example. The same thing happens, but now we have two checks. So this is a jump table and two ifs. Okay, why does it happen like that? Why isn't it a part of jump table? Because if we have an, if this is, a, this is an index of that table, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a continuous block in memory, which will have a lot of wasted memory because this is a big gap. And that big gap is not going to be allocated by anything. So that's just a waste of memory. And that's why we don't do it like that. So let's add a third um, item. Much better, let's add a third case. And now, as you can see, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna have a offset table, so jump offset table, and we're gonna generate another table just for these two. So, as you can see, um, the compiler is really smart here because if the gap is big enough and there's um, you know enough items between these two gaps, so we're actually splitting them into this thing set divided by the gap, then we can generate multiple jump tables and it's going to have really good performance as well because that check and that offset that we need to add in order to be able to set ourselves correctly here is not that expensive as compared to um, you know just generating a big table because that will consume a lot of memory so that's um, that's one of the ways that the compiler optimizes int so if you like the video leave a like possibly subscribe if you, if you think that this has bring you some value and in the next video we're gonna see how this handles booleans, uh, you know, boolean expressions and possibly string expressions as well, because that's going to be a completely different optimization technique. So stay tuned and that's all for today. Thank you and bye.